Let's finish up partial fraction decomposition. And as I said, I did the case that I think is most significant, which is where you've got a linear expression divided by a vector quadratic. Um, I think this is the most significant case for two reasons. Um, first of all, most quadratics you find in the wild do a factor smooth. Um, I mean, they might not factor nicely. You might need a computer to find the roots or something, but most quadratics that have real roots have two real roots. Um, the second reason I think this case is the most significant is just on a practical level, um, we can definitely use partial fractions to integrate something that looks like this. But going briefly through the other cases, So you could have a linear expression, and then you could have a, um, a perfect square in the denominator. So here, I'm assuming that these linear expressions are different. Um, here, I mean, making allowances for the fact that that A is a constant and we can just pull it out. We have the same expression repeated twice. Um, so good news, bad news, I guess. The good news is that um, you can always use partial fraction decomposition to compute an integral like this. It's another case that just works. Um, the bad news is that performing the partial fraction decomposition in this situation is a headache. Like maybe when you were doing that in class problem yesterday, you thought that was a headache. Well, things can always be worse. And um, I guess just to start with, if we have a linear expression. And then we have a repeated factor in the denominator. Let's get rid of the integral sign for now and just state this as a theorem about rational functions. It's going to be a constant divided by x minus k plus a constant divided by x minus k squared. And you're going to you're going to keep increasing the power down here until you reach the power over on the left. So like if you had x minus k cubed, it would be a over x minus k plus b over x minus k squared plus c <laughs> over x minus k cubed. 
And the good news, as I said, is that we can integrate all of these. Like the integral of this is a natural log. The integral of this is what? Negative B over X minus K to the first. Um, all of these we can integrate using little u substitutions. I mean, I'm using here the fact that b over x minus k squared is b times x minus k to the negative second. And if you do a little u substitution, that u be x minus k, then to integrate this, you just bump the power up by one and then divide by that new power. So all of these terms we can integrate. So this is useful as an integration tool. The heavy side method, however, breaks down when you try to find the coefficients. And you have to go through a much more irritating and cumbersome process. So let's see how this works in practice. 2x plus 3 over x minus 4 squared. And my claim. is that I can break <laughs> this fraction apart. And we need to find A and we need to find B. And again, notice we have a we have a two here. So I started with a first power. I went up to a second power. And then because the second power matched this two over there, I stopped. And that's what the decomposition is going to look like. And to start with, it's the same first step as the heavy side process. So we can multiply both sides by x minus 4 squared. We can multiply both sides by the denominator of that fraction. <coughs> And x minus 4 squared times this will have an x minus 4. x minus 4 squared times this <laughs> will have perfect cancellation. This x minus 4 squared and this x minus 4 squared Cancel. And let me copy this. And if you remember the heavy side method, it was selecting values of x that turn expressions to zero. So we can select the 
partition that off. We cancel that. X equals four. And X equals four is going to turn X minus four to zero. So we get, what do we get? Eight plus three is 11. Um, X minus four, that's zero. And we get 11 equals B. So, great. It said the heavy side method wouldn't work, but it's working fine so far. We found B. And I mean, the issue now is that um, there's no other number we can plug in that's going to turn anything to zero. X equals four was it. And X equals four allowed us to find B, but it didn't allow us to find A. So we still have this A. <laughs> And the process is I'm going to distribute this out. AX minus 4A plus 11. And I guess it's not actually so bad when we just have a uh, square. What I'm going to say now is, well, all right, we've got a linear expression over here, and we've got a linear expression over there, and those linear expressions are the same. They're equal to each other. Well, how are two linear expressions equal? Well, they're equal if they have the same slopes and if they have the same y-intercepts. So the slope over here on the left is 2. The slope over on the right is a. The y-intercept over on the left is um, three. The y-intercept over on the right is negative four a plus 11. And um, we can read a off here. So, I mean, maybe I was oversetting how um, difficult this would be. A equals two. And 11 minus eight is indeed three. So this choice of A satisfies both of these equations. This wasn't as, what did I, this wasn't really where I meant to change it. I meant to change it here. Um, this wasn't as bad as it could have been because I did this kind of pseudo heavy side process. I said, well, the heavy side process isn't going to work totally, but we can use the heavy side process to find B. And that really helped us. If we hadn't done that, we had 2x plus 3 equals A. times x minus four 
plus B. If we hadn't used the heavy side process to find that B equals 11, and we just done an argument like this, we would have gotten, well, two equals A, three equals negative four A plus B. So again, I guess maybe I'm really oversetting the difficulty of this. You could read A off from that first equation, then you could uh, plug two <laughs> into the second equation to find that B equals 11. <laughs> ah, this thing that I have is lingering. I'm, my throat no longer hurts, but I could do without this cough. <laughs> so once we found A and B, A is two, B is 11. Let me, this frame is already pretty cluttered. So two over X minus four plus B over X minus four squared. If we wanted to integrate this, which is our goal. Well, we can now just integrate each of these terms separately. So this is a natural logarithm. This, <laughs> so again, we have this power, and when we, I'm sorry, B is 11. That's right, A is two, B is 11. Um, you can do this as a little U substitution, if that will help. Um, U equals X minus four, DU equals DX. In any event, when we integrate this, we're going to get negative 11 times X minus four, to the negative first. <clears throat> and this integral we have successfully taken. Um, this genuinely does get quite ugly if instead of like having x minus four to the second power, we'd had x minus four to the fifth power or something. I know I kept doing that thing where I said something was going to be difficult and then it didn't actually end up being very difficult. Um, that's because we only have a square. This process gets very messy if we have our um, term raised to a higher power. So I guess going with my philosophy that really messy calculus shouldn't be done by hand anyway, I, um, I won't show 
a more complicated example of this, nor will I make you do a more complicated example in the homework. Let me let me at least show you the major remaining case. I say I wrote unfactor quadratics. Okay, even before I do that, let me make a general remark about partial fraction decomposition. I mean, I've talked about it in these sort of specific cases. Say that we have a linear over a quadratic. Say that we have something like this, a linear over a power. Um, Partial fraction decomposition is for integrating rational functions. So you can attempt partial fraction decomposition anytime you have a polynomial divided by another polynomial. But I say any time there is kind of a restriction <laughs> the degree of the top polynomial needs to be less than the degree of the bottom polynomial. And if it isn't, there are tricks you can do. You can do polynomial division, but I don't want to spend a lecture on polynomial division. So we'll just um, we'll just look at this situation. So by the way, this situation, this case is actually more powerful than I made it seem. We don't need a linear polynomial up here. We just need a polynomial whose degree is less than n. The major remaining case, it's, it's a fact of algebra that polynomial was factor. They might not factor nicely. They might end up in fact factoring in a very ugly way and you have to use a calculator or a computer to do it. But polynomial is factor as linear terms and quadratic terms. So our remaining case is if we have something that looks like this. So we factor the bottom, we factor the denominator, and we factor it as, as far as it will go. And we end up with a quadratic and that quadratic does not factor over the real number. 
flowers. It does not have real roots. So partial fraction decomposition is very negative, let's say. We take the denominator of the fraction and we factor it and we get an X minus four, and we get this. Well, we've already seen what happens when we have a linear expression in the denominator. Um, we get a term that looks like this. And if we expanded this, if we added an x plus two squared, we'd get a b over x plus two and a c over x plus two squared. So you see that each term in the denominator just adds a term into the partial fraction decomposition. So the question we need to ask is, what term does that quadratic add into the partial fraction decomposition? And it adds a linear term over the quadratic term. And from a practical point of view, this is a bad thing because this linear term over the quadratic term is the first thing we've gotten doing these partial fraction decompositions that we might not be able to integrate. We don't have any integration technique that's going to definitely 100% let us integrate that. In fact, I'll go further. We're more likely than not to be unable to integrate this. If you just have a random linear expression over a random quadratic, there's no reason on earth we should be able to integrate something like that. So, of course, the issue then becomes that you have this ugly integral and you do all of the work of the partial fraction decomposition. And then at the end of the day, you get this new ugly integral and you still can't deal with it. So what was any of that? So, um, it's for this reason that I don't really want to dwell on this case, um, but I do, th <laughs> do think it's good to at least see it. That's, uh, that example on the previous frame was pretty mucky, let's let's attempt to use partial fraction decomposition to integrate to this thing. And I say attempt, I pulled this example out of the air. So there's no guarantee that it's going to <laughs> end up working well. But let's see what happens. We'll start with
the first step of the heavy side method. So we'll say, okay, we can do this partial fraction decomposition. That's sort of a theorem we have. Let's say <laughs> that we have done it. Let's say that that rational expression is equal to that sum. And let's try to find A and B and C so that this equality is true. First step of the heavy side process is to clear that denominator. We'll multiply both sides by that expression. And we end up with 2x squared plus x plus 1 equals a times x squared plus x plus 1 plus the x plus c times x minus one. <laughs> and now the, now the heavy side method really fails us. I guess it was really this that I was thinking about earlier when I kept saying how sort of ugly these problems could get. Um, we could let X be, um, we could let X be one, I guess, but if, um, X is one, what happens? Let me, let me go over here so we're not crunched at the bottom of the frame. Um, the point of letting X be one, I mean, we're thinking back to the heavy side method, that would make one of our expressions zero. And this does help us. If we let X be one, we do get something out of this. We get four equals A times three, and we can solve for A. A is four thirds. So we certainly have accomplished something here. But that's the extent that the heavy side method can help us. X equals one is the only choice we can make that turns anything to zero. And now we're left saying, okay, on the left, we have a quadratic. On the right, we have a quadratic. Let's boil this out. So, 
So quadratics are going to be the same if their individual coefficients are the same. So we can group our terms. 2x squared plus x plus 1 equals 4 thirds plus b times x squared plus uh, 4 thirds minus b plus c times x plus four thirds minus C. Good heavens. Um, so as I say, two quadratics are the same if their coefficients are the same. So the coefficients in front of the x squared terms have to be the same. And the coefficient in front of the x terms have to be the same. The constants have to be the same. And I mean, we can figure out B and C from this. It, I'm not claiming that this is undoable. I mean, in fact, from one, we can get B, e, and from this, we can get C. Um, two is six thirds. So six thirds equals four thirds plus B. B must be a two thirds. And four, um, three thirds equals four thirds minus C. So C must be one-third. And we didn't end up using that second equation, but it is true that four-thirds minus two-thirds plus one-third does equal one. So that second equation is true. Good heavens. Never felt more defeated than when I'm doing these problems. But we're coming to the end. We found B and we found C and we definitely found A, but I appear not to have written it down like a chump. Um, a was four thirds. So when we do this, we've got four thirds over X minus one. B is two thirds. C is one third. Oops. Clear out 
that it Fridays, so we don't have stuff leading into itself. And um, huh. this actually this actually works. I randomly um picked an example that works out. We we have to uh, mess around with it a little. If the four third over x minus one, that's fine. We'll get a natural logarithm. Thus, and now if we pull out a one third, we get a two x plus one in the top, and we get an x squared plus x plus one in the bottom, and we can integrate that using u substitution. By a quirk of fate, the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. And if I were, let's clear all of this. So if I were to finish this out, I would integrate this and get four thirds ln x minus one. And then I get one third ln x squared plus x plus one. But again, it was kind of a that this problem worked out so nicely. Like if instead of C being one third, C had also been two thirds, then I wouldn't have been able to use U substitution here. Um, the substitution I did worked because the derivative of this is 2x plus 1, and we happened to have 2x plus 1 up here. If we had a 2x plus 2, the entire process would break down. So, it's not it's not reliable. There's no guarantee that you'll actually be able to use this to perform integration, even if in this particular case things did end up working very cleanly. Ooh. And that's U substitution and uh that's really integration techniques. We are, uh, we're not done with integration. We've got a few sections left. We've got numerical integration, and then we've got improper integrals where like, what if we're integrating over a region where a function is discontinuous? And then we should have time to do some applications, maybe probability. So integration will go up, um, up until uh, our midterm break. But as far as computing integrals, what we've done is what we have. These are the standard techniques that get taught in calculus too. Thank <laughs> you.
And I will, um, I graded your tests. I didn't bring them. They were all very good. I'll probably just uh, scan the pages I have comments on and send them to you. Um, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll see you. Uh, see you next week. See you next Monday.